Jesus lives. But before that, I want to I wanna recommend a book to you. And it's called Unwrapping the Greatest Gift. And I love Advent. Advent is a, is a season of fresh devotions. And this is one of the best Advent devotional books I have ever read. It's actually written for children, but it will touch your heart as an adult. Um, the, the wording that she uses, the challenges that she gives you, I am serious. I, I read it this morning. Brian and I read it all last year. I gave it to each of my kids. Um, this is really like a worthy investment. So if you enjoy doing devotions, if you enjoy that season of Advent and setting that time apart just to kind of prepare your heart for his coming, it's just one of those books I recommend. It's called Unwrapping the Greatest Gift by Ann Voskamp. So anyway, if you want to take a look at it after service, you can do that. You know, I don't get anything for recommending the book, so it's not like it's a sales pitch in that way. But honestly, it is just, it's a life transformational book. And it's written for ordinary people like me to be able to understand how to prepare my heart for the Lord's coming. But I don't know about you, but I think sometimes the holidays can be a little taxing. You know, we clean, we cook, we clean some more, we cook some more, and then the cycle seems to repeat itself. And for me, sometimes it seems like just as soon as I get my fall decorations up and the pumpkins are laid and all of that stuff is put out, then it's time to bring all those decorations down and, you know, and restart for Christmas. And Christmas sometimes seems to involve a lot of busyness, hurriedness, and being exhausted. Am I the only one? Or does other people feel that way too? You know, sometimes it's a state of let's hurry up so that we can relax, only to hurry up again and find ourselves just wanting the holidays to be over so that we can get back to normal. I don't even know what normal is anymore. Is there really such a thing as normal? I think there are seasons, but I don't know about normal. And I know for me personally, I'm really coming out of a season of, of retreats and conferences and guests being at our house for an extended period of time. And I'm finding myself wanting to get my house in order so that I can actually enjoy Christmas in a way that is slow, unhurried, savoring every moment of being with Jesus, enjoying family, friends, and making room for strangers. My heart is expectant for the unexpected Christmas miracles, the wondrous impossible. You see, miracles happen when we speak words that make souls stronger. Miracles happen. Everyday miracles happen all the time. And I don't know about you, but I think that there has got to be a better way than a hurried, frantic, frenzied, not enjoying the season kind of being. One of the things that I have discovered is that when I have no eyes for the small signs of God's presence, such as the smile of a baby, the carefree play of children, words of encouragement and gestures of love offered by, fr offered by friends, that I will always be tempted to despair. That when I don't make room for God in the little things, I'm tempted to think that he's not there. But when I slow down enough to see God in my every day, I'm always filled with hope and wonder. Because I want to declare to you that Christmas is not a time to despair, but it's a time to hope and it's a time to believe. You know, as I've been studying about Advent, I looked it up and I love Webster's 1828 dictionary and this is what it says. A coming, appropriately the coming of our Savior. And in the calendar, it includes four Sabbaths before Christmas which is why today is the beginning of Christmas. And Sabbath is four 24-hour periods of stopping before Christmas Day. It is an extended season of devotion with reference to the coming of Christ in the flesh and his second coming to judge the world. It's an arrival, a start, a beginning, a dawn, an initiation, and an introduction. Advent is that period of great anticipatory joy. It's a time of preparation for the celebration of Christ's arrival in Bethlehem as a helpless infant. A little yet big miracle. And it's not preparation for cleaning or for purchasing of gifts. It's a preparation for the second coming of Christ himself. It's preparing more room in our hearts for more of his presence in our lives. I mean, think about that. More room in our hearts for more of his presence in our lives. 
Advent inspires us to ask the question, am I preparing for the right things this Christmas? That's the question that I want you to be thinking about. Am I preparing for the right things this Christmas? Am I taking the time to prepare my heart for the celebration of Christ's first coming and the anticipation of his second? I'm going to say that again. Am I taking the time to prepare my heart for the celebration of Christ's first coming and the anticipation of his second? You see, the four weeks of Advent are often thought of as symbolizing the four different ways that Christ comes or the four different ways that he arrives. At his birth as a helpless infant, that little yet big miracle. At his arrival in the hearts of believers. How many of you remember that very first time when Christ arrived in your life? I mean, I remember it. This little church in Prescott, Maine. I feel like Paul, I could be the chief of all sinners. I was a messed up, complicated girl. And yet Christ came in and he met me right where I was. And he gave me a different way to live, a different way to think, a different way to act. Then, at his death. And finally, at his arrival on Judgment Day. Christ's second coming will also one day abruptly interrupt our stopover here on earth. Like abruptly interrupt. I remember when my kids were little. In fact, one time it was one of those, those times I was giving one of my kids a little bath and, and she looked up at me and she said, Mom, do you think Jesus is coming today? I was like, I, I don't know, Brianne, maybe. Maybe. But when's the last time we woke up and we said, Lord, are you coming today? Like that, that expectation. Lord, are you coming today? Is today the day? Well, that's what Advent is about. It's about expecting this second return of the Lord, which is going to be a glorious day. Advent reminds us of his first arrival, and it prepares our hearts for his second arrival. But how do we prepare for such a coming? That's really what I want to talk to you about today. And there are five little words in Matthew 11 which intrigue me. They imply that there is a different way besides the way of busyness and exhaustion, anxiousness and despair, of being in such a hurry that I miss being fully present with God and with others. And I believe that these five little words could change Christmas for all of us. Here they are. Watch how I do it. Can we say it together? Watch how I do it. But before we discuss these five little words, I want to give you a little bit of background from what's been happening here in Matthew. So in Matthew 10, Jesus calls the 12 disciples and he gives them power, I like the way the message says it, to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. And then he sends them out and this is what he says to them. Go, can everyone say go? Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. So I want you to think about your neighborhood. And Jesus is telling you, go to the lost, confused people right in your neighborhood and tell them the kingdom of God is here. Bring health to the sick, raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out the demons. You have been treated generously, so live generously. You and I as Christ followers are called to live generous lives. And then he goes on and he says, stay alert. This is hazardous work I am assigning you to. He goes on to say, this is a large work. Can everyone say large work? Can you say hazardous work? And this is what he says, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cup of cool water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. The smallest act, like sometimes we think we have to get the best, biggest present for Christmas in order for Christmas to be special. But I want you to think about, I don't know, the next 30 days or so between now and Christmas. And what are some of the smallest acts that you can do every day to let people know that Christ is alive and he's present and he loves them? What are some of the smallest things 
that you could do. You heard Charlie, Charlie talk about CAST. CAST is coming up. It starts on Wednesday. You know what? We don't... <clears throat> Sometimes we think of them and us. And that's just not the way it is. We are all an us and assumed to be us's, right? And, and, and there's, there's no real difference. Like whether you have a home or you don't have a home, people are people. People have souls. People have emotions. People desire to be loved. And I want to encourage you. You may feel a little intimidated about coming out this next week, but I want to encourage you to just come and be yourself. Ask the Lord, what's in my hand? What's in my cupboard? What gift is inside of me that I can bring this week to bless other people? Because that's really what Jesus is saying here. It's, it's hazardous work. It's, it's a large work. It's a big work. But the smallest act is really what Christmas is all about. It's about sitting down at this table when everyone's eating and asking somebody how their day has been or how their week is going. The smallest act. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Then in Matthew 11, John the Baptist is in prison and he sends some of his disciples to ask Jesus if he is the one they have been expecting or should they still wait and look for another to arrive or to come. And this is what Jesus tells them. The blind see, the lame, walk, le the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the wretched of the earth learn that God is on their side. I tell you what, there is somebody here today, and you need to know God is on your side. He is on your side. And then Jesus talks to the crowd about John, and he says, Are you listening to me? Are you really listening Man, if you're a parent, you've asked that question at least a million times, right? Are you listening to me? Are you really listening? I, I kind of think maybe that's the way Jesus was feeling. That's my interpretation of it anyway. Are you listening? Because sometimes we hear, but we don't listen. Because really to listen is to hear and obey. And sometimes we just hear but we don't obey, and then we don't really listen. And so first he talks to the crowd, and then it says he talks to the cities. And where he has worked the hardest, but whose people had responded the least, they shrug their shoulders, and they go their own way. And then it's followed by several woe to you statements. I don't like those, just for the record. You know, woe to you, and woe to you, and woe to you. But I want to say that when we choose to shrug our shoulders at the Lord and go our own way that eventually there really does come a woe to you kind of moment and, and I just want to say please don't be a shoulder shrugger don't be one of those who goes your own way because it may seem like no big deal at the moment but going your own way has some grave consequences and it usually ends with a woe to you you see, Christ wants all of your heart. He wants you completely and utterly dependent upon him. Choose his ways as soon as you can. And I just want to say it's never too late to choose his ways. It's never too late to repent from being a shoulder shrugger, from going your own way. I mean, his arms are wide open. I think about the story of the prodigal son. And when he came home, that father just ran. His arms were wide open. And that's the kind of love that God extends to you and I. This wide open armed kind of love when we come back. He never gives up on us. He has unfailing love. I was driving to church this morning and I felt like the Lord kind of gave me this word and I'm going to share it with you said, so many of us stay away from Jesus because we feel unworthy. But what we fail to realize is that he came to earth because we are unworthy. He makes us worthy. So if you're here today and you feel unworthy, you feel like you don't measure up, you feel like maybe you've made too many mistakes, I want to say to you, you're why Jesus came. I am why Jesus came. Because of my unworthiness, he came as this little, beautiful, yet big, tiny miracle. 
here to planet Earth so that you and I and all of the world could be made worthy if we would just choose to accept him. So that's a word for us today. Don't let your unworthiness keep you away from the Lord. That is why he came. Jesus will go to impossible lengths to rescue us, church. Love never stops dreaming of a way to draw close again. How many of you have ever been estranged from somebody? You had a friendship that went south. You had a child that went south. You had a, a marriage or, or just something that you could tell that it was falling apart. And you know what? It's like love never gives up on that relationship. Love is always dreaming and believing for restoration. And that's what Jesus does with us. He is always believing and dreaming of this day when we are completely restored to the King of Kings and the Lord of, and the Lord of Lords. It doesn't matter how far we go. Like Jesus is saying, I am right here. I am right here. And now comes the good part. That was good too. Matthew 11, 25 through 30. After all of this, Jesus talks to the crowds. Then Jesus talks to the city. And then it says he abruptly breaks into prayer. Matthew 11, 25 through 30. I'm going to read it from the message. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. And this is what he said. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You have concealed your ways. Can you say your ways? from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but you spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Can you say ordinary people? Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. And then Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. No more woe to you, right? He's talking tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself, Jesus said. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. I'm an anyone, and so are you. So if we're willing to listen, Jesus has something to say to us today. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Everyone say that. Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it, is what the scripture says. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. As we enter the Christmas season, I believe that Jesus had a word, has a word for us, like in Matthew 11. He is speaking tenderly to us who labor and are heavy laden and are overburdened, tired and worn out. He's wooing us ordinary folk to learn his ways, okay, which are very different than the world's ways. And he is willing, in fact, he's ready to go over it line by line, Precept upon precept, anyone willing to listen. And remember, listen means what? Hear and obey. So what are his ways? What are his ways? The first way of Jesus is to come to him. Can you say that again? Come to him. And, and you know what that means? It means movement toward a specific person or place. All right? Come to him. So my question to you is, what is that next step that you need to take in order to come a little bit closer to Jesus? Just what's that next step? For each of us, <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit different. But in order to learn his ways, we must come to him. We have to take that step. For some of us, it might be, you know what? I'm going to learn to worship just a little bit more over this holiday season over Christmas. I hate happy holidays, by the way. I'm a, I'm a Mary. They say happy holidays. I say Merry Christmas, right? But, but you know what? One little step. What does it mean for you to come to him? What's that going to look like? Maybe it's just, you know what? I'm going to read this devotion every day. It's just going to be one little step so I can get a glimpse of who God is. 
one step. So that's the question. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. What is one step that I can do to come toward Jesus this Advent season? It's turning away from something in order to go in another direction. Come to him. Then the next thing that Matthew 11 tells us is get away with him. Everyone say get away. I, I love that word. I like getaways. Brian and I usually try to plan three or four little getaways every Monday when the courts are closed. We'll try to have a little three-day weekend. Sometimes it's at home. Sometimes it's actually getting away. In January, one of our favorite things is to go to Williamsburg for a couple of days. But how many of you know that getaways look different than every days, right? Right? They do. A getaway looks just a little bit different than an everyday. And if we want to know Jesus' ways, first we have to come to him, and then we have to figure out how to get away. It's a short vacation. It's a place to escape. A place remote from everyday life to use for a vacation. So what is your place to escape to, to get away? Now here's it. To not get away from something right? Sometimes, for example, we'll go watch a movie and that's our little getaway, right? This isn't what scripture is talking about. It's getting away with him, not just getting away, right? You can go to the beach or you can go to the beach and be with Jesus, right? You can be silent or you can be silent in the presence of the Lord. So this is talking about a getaway with him, and so for me, when I think of a getaway with him, I think of maybe some silence or solitude, that could be a getaway. Maybe it's a getaway to walk around Oak Grove Park. It's a getaway from your everyday life to be with him. Sometimes I think a getaway could be a Sabbath. We believe in Sabbath around here. Every seven days, stopping and resting and being in the presence of the Lord. Living life a little bit differently on those 24 hours. So what does your getaway look like? How are you going to get away right? How are you going to get away this Advent season so that you can learn his ways? See, sometimes I believe that getaways are designed so that our souls can catch up with our bodies because our bodies are going a million miles a minute, but our souls need time to catch up. And that's what a getaway is for. That's what silence is for. That's what solitude is for. That's what Sabbath is for for our souls to catch up to our bodies. So how can you get away with Jesus daily or weekly between now and Christmas to prepare for his arrival? The next thing this scripture tells us is to walk with him. A walk is typically something that's very easy. You know, at least from your car to the sanctuary, most of us, as I look around, walked here today, right? A walk is pretty easy. It's not like I say to Trudy, hey, Trudy, let's go do a marathon, 13.1 miles, right? Trudy would be like, I don't know if that's so easy, right? But she may, if I said, hey, Trudy, let's take a walk to my car, that would probably be pretty easy. That's something that we could do. So... A walk is typically something very easy, but there's also a way of walking, right? You know, some of us, for example, if you were my daughter, Brianne, this is how she walks. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, I can't even catch up to you. So when I'm with Brianne, there's no walking with Brianne. Brianne walks, and then I trail behind, right? But when Brian and I take a walk, if we take a walk in the evening, we love to walk and talk and pray, kind of like Jesus, we talk a little, we pray a little, but we love to walk. And, and there's a pace that we set when we walk together, right? And we're usually holding hands, and it's just kind of a leisurely pace. But it's, it's keeping company with, right? It's, it's walking at this, at this pace, hand in hand. And that's really what Jesus is saying. Like, if you want to learn his ways, then first of all, you got to take that step. What's that step for you going to be to just draw a little bit closer? And then what's your getaway going to be? How are you going to get away to have something that's different than an everyday? Right? This, this, this Advent season, this Christmas season, so you're not hurried and frenzied. And then what's it going to look like for you to walk with Jesus hand in hand? Let Jesus set the pace of the walk, right? 
It's a journey made on foot. Can I say this? Like if you read scripture, Jesus was busy. He had a lot of things on his plate, but he was never in a hurry. In fact, I don't ever remember reading a scripture, and I could be wrong. There's more scholars in here than, than I am. But I don't ever remember reading a scripture where Jesus is running to go somewhere. Right? I remember he was mad in the temple courts. But I don't, I don't, I don't ever remember like him running. I remember Jack Hayford when he talked about um, taking these tours in Israel. He said, we're going to run where Jesus walked. You know, it's like Jesus walked, but we're going to run there. We're going to get off the bus. You know, we're going to look at this site and then you get back on and you go. And some of those tours to Israel can be kind of, kind of fast paced, right? But Jesus has a way of walking. And so my question to you is, how can we eliminate hurry this season and walk with Jesus? How can you eliminate hurry this season and walk with Jesus? And then the next thing that Matthew 11 tells us is then we work with him, right? But I want you to see what took place before us working with Jesus. We had to do what? There's no PowerPoint, so it's all about you taking notes and listening today, right? So the first thing that you do is what? Come to him, right? The second thing that you do is what? Get away. You need to get away from your everyday, right? But with him. The third thing that you do is you walk with him, right? And then it tells us that out of this being with Jesus, then comes this work. And we learn that what? It's a large work. We learn that it's a hazardous work. We learn that we need to stay awake. We learn that it's just the tiniest little things that make the difference when we work with Jesus. But first, we come away, we get away, we walk with him. And then we work with him. But boy, do we get that one backwards. Don't we? We do all this work and then suddenly realize when our head hits the pillow, we really had no time for Jesus or there was no room in the inn that day, right? I love you, Jesus, but there is no room in the inn today because I'm busy working for you rather than with you. Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. And so one of the questions I want you to ask this Christmas season, this Advent season, is Jesus, will you show and reveal to me who the least of these are? Because they look, they look different every single day. Can I just say the least of these? Some of them may be some of the people who come to cast. But some of the least of these may be somebody who's actually driving that Mercedes and he's just as lost as the homeless person on the street. So you have to ask the Lord for discernment and say, God, who is the least of these in my life today? And how do you want to, how can I work with you this Christmas season? How can I work with you this Advent so that, that I can prepare hearts. I can be in partnership with what you're doing. I mean, that's really a powerful question. It's laboring with the Lord rather than laboring in your own strength. Scripture tells us that Jesus did what he saw the Father do, and Jesus said what he heard the Father say. So, what is Jesus doing in your family, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your workplace, and how can you partner with him? The last thing it says is keep company with him. Don't get ahead of him and don't lag behind him. Just be with him. I looked up keep company and it means to associate with others for conversation or pleasure. How many of you love those visits where there's no hidden agenda? <laughs> right? Like somebody says, oh Sherry, can I take you out for coffee? And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder what this coffee really means. Is somebody mad at me? Is somebody irritated with me? Is somebody, you know, and there are times where that happens, right? Coffee's not really about coffee. Coffee's about, I am mad at you and I need to have a conversation with you or things like that. But then you have these friends in your life that, that when they say, hey, can I come over? You know that there's no hidden agenda. They just want to enjoy your what? They just want to enjoy your company. 
And, and there's this keeping company with Jesus that he just wants to enjoy you. He just wants to have conversation with you. He just wants to be with you. So what does that look like for you? You know, sometimes you'll hear us ask questions like, hey, have you been in your word lately? Have you been reading the word? Have, have you been spending time with God? And those are great questions. We need to do that. But you know what kind of like changes that question up a little bit is, how have you been enjoying God lately? I mean, I think that's an even better question. Sometimes I enjoy God in the word. Sometimes I enjoy God in worship. Sometimes I enjoy God just by being quiet. Sometimes I enjoy God by looking up at the stars or taking a walk in the park. But how are you enjoying God? That's really what this keep company means. It means to associate with others for conversation or pleasure. So the question for this one is, how will you be enjoying the Lord in conversation and pleasure, keeping company with him over the Advent season? And here's what I want you to see. If you will do these five things, if you will learn his ways, and that's what this is, it's learning his ways, it's, let's say it together, come to him, get away with him, walk with him, work with him, keep company with him. Let's say it again. Come to him. Get away with... No, 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 no. Come to him. Get away with him. Walk with him. Work with him. Keep company with him. If you'll do those five things, it then goes on in this particular scripture to say these are the results. You know, if you're a strategist, if you're a hard worker, you want to know what are the results. If I put in 40 hours... What, is, what are the results going to be, right? Are you going to get paid? Is, is somebody's life going to be changed? What's going to happen at the end of your 40-hour work week, right? So here are the results if you will do those things. First of all, you're going to get a real rest. Man, how many of you have ever had a fake rest, right? You, for example, sometimes I'll be like, oh, let me just veg out to the show. And then the show, you walk away and you feel like you need to take a shower or something, right? It's like, that isn't what I thought it was. That wasn't the rest that I wanted, right? And so sometimes we do things and we think we're resting, but man, it just ends up stirring us up inside. And so Jesus says that if you'll do these things that I just talked about, I'm going to give you a real rest. And this is what a real rest is. It's relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. You know what? I think Fred finds that when he goes hunting. He finds relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and quiet for his soul. Right? There's a real rest that God has for us if we'll do these things. Finally, he says... That his ways, what we just talked about, will empower us to recover our lives. To regain something. To get or obtain that which was lost. You know, when we are in such a hurry, we typically don't spend time with Jesus. And when that happens, we lose something. Have you ever just at the end of the day felt like you lost something? Like, like what did I miss? Like, I missed something today. Have you ever seen that picture of, of, I think it's like, I don't know if it's a video or a picture. I think it's more of a video because it's this little boy who's pulling on the mom's shirt and she doesn't have time. And he pulls like, hey, mommy, hey, mommy, hey, mommy. And he's like, she's like, no, I got to cook dinner. Hey, mommy, hey, mommy, no, I got to run the vacuum. Hey, mommy, hey, mommy, no, I got to do this or I got to do that. Finally, at the end of the day, the kid's in the bed asleep and she sees this little picture like beside his bed that just basically said, hey, mommy, I love you. But she never had time to hear it because she was so busy doing stuff, right? And and we lose things when we get to be in such a hurry. And, and, And that's what the world tells us that Christmas is all about. Hurry to this store because you don't want to miss that sale. And hurry to that store, you know, or hurry up and go buy this or hurry up and go do that. But I want to say that Jesus wants you to recover your lives He wants you to take back. He doesn't want you to be that slave in Egypt, working, working, working. There has to be a time when this gets turned off. 
There has to be a time when you can just set it aside. Things that are meant to save us time, they steal our time. We're constantly having to see what's the next post or the next picture or the next whatever. Let me just check one more email. Sometimes we just need to put our phone on silent or we need to turn off the notifications on our emails. Right? And so I just want to encourage you. Jesus wants you to recover your life. And that's the result of doing those five things. And finally, one of my favorite is we're told that his ways will teach us the unforced rhythms of grace. Silence, solitude, and Sabbath, they fill us with a grace, church. Generosity of spirit, a capacity to tolerate, accommodate, or forgive people. If you're struggling to tolerate people, I want to encourage you that you don't have healthy rhythms. If you don't see people as something to be loved, you're probably way too busy. And I want to encourage you to come away, get away, walk with, work with, and keep company with Jesus so that he can build this tolerance, if you will, for being around other people that is just genuinely a grace to love people. And we can only get that grace from Jesus because people irritate us sometimes, right? They get under our skin. We think, oh Lord, not one more phone call. If you find yourself in that place, I want to encourage you, you probably don't have healthy rhythms in your life. But God is wooing you today. He's saying, will you help me? Will you let Advent be an excuse to help you to develop some healthy rhythms in your life? The unforced rhythms of grace. I like Mark chapter 6 because it says that Jesus says to his disciples, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. They left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. And then it says, when Jesus was done with that, as he stepped out of the boat, there was a large crowd and he had compassion for them. He had compassion. And that's what learning his ways does for you. It gives you a compassion for people that you wouldn't normally have. Where you might be disgusted or irritated or not have time, when you learn these unforced rhythms of grace, you'll have a compassion to love people like you've never been able to love them before. And, and I'm telling you, we live in a world where people are desperate for love. They are desperate to know that Jesus is real, that he is alive, that, that there's a place for them in the kingdom of God. And it's up to us. It's up to us to live life slow enough to be able to show that kind of love. I want to close with, uh, with this post that I read on Facebook. Um, it was by this guy named Ian Spears. I don't really know anything about him, but I really liked his post. And this is what he said. Today is the dawning of the church's new year with Advent. Advent is not simply a prelude to Christmas, but it's a time when we look for and prepare our hearts for Christ's return, for his second Advent. While our culture insists that we hurry, Advent invites us to be still, to watch, and to wait. The lectionary prayer for the first week of Advent begins like this. Unexpected God, your Advent, your coming alarms us. More than anything, this prayer captures the spirit of the season. In Advent, we confront the stark reality that God is breaking in on our world. And we must ask ourselves, are we ready for him? Have we prepared ourselves, our families, and our churches for the coming of God? What the prophets called the great and awesome day of the Lord. When Christ first came, he came gently, a babe to an unwed mother sojourning with her husband to a distant city. Yet his people had no room for him. If Christ came today, how would we react? Would we have room for him? Would we even notice? The trouble with our cultural holiday season is not so much the rush and commercialization. The real danger is that our lives become filled 
to distractions, so consumed with trivialities and to-do lists that we leave no room for God, only to be caught unaware when he breaks into our world again. This ultimately is what Advent is about, waiting for God and in our waiting, making room for him in our lives and hearts. As the lectionary prayer continues, wake us from drowsy worship, from the sleep that neglects love, and the sedative of misdirected frenzy. Awaken us now to your coming and bend our angers into your peace. Michael, if you would come, I want to close in worship. And this is my prayer, church, that we will learn his ways as we prepare our hearts for the second coming of Christ because he is coming back and we don't want to miss it. And, and you know what? Sadly, I think we could miss it if we refuse to come away, get away, walk with him, work with him, and keep company with him. Wouldn't that be so sad to be so busy doing things for him that we miss him when he actually arrives? And you know, it's only going to happen when we learn to slow down and stop and pause. And so this Advent season, I believe that Christ wants us to have a real rest. He wants us to recover our lives and he wants us to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. If we could close with good, good father actually. And here's one thing that I'm certain of. Jesus has abundantly more for us this Christmas, but it's never going to be found or bought in a store. Do I hear an amen to that? So I want you to just stand and I want you to just lift your hands to the Lord. And I just want to pray that we would learn his ways. And I want to pray that this Advent season would be unhurried for you and I. And that's a choice. It's a choice to stop and to be and to enjoy. So just lift your hands to the Lord for a moment. Father God, I just thank you so much that you speak, first of all, tenderly to us. I thank you, Father God, that, that you have a different way for us, the church, to live this Christmas season. Father God, that we would prepare our hearts for your second coming, that we would wake up expectant, saying, Lord, is it today? Lord, are you coming today? Father God, I pray that every believer here would make room in their hearts for you. <coughs> Father God, that we would come to you, that we would get away with you, that we would walk with you, that we would work with you, and we would keep company with you and not the world. Father, I pray for a spirit of refreshment to fall upon us. Lord, that we would be aware of your presence. And Lord, finally, that you would open our eyes to the least of these, whoever that might be. And Lord, use us to do the miraculous, to bring the love of Jesus into the everyday world that we live in. And Lord, remind us that you're a good, good father. And so Lord, I just pray that this song would wash over us as we leave and we would know how loved we are by you and that we would go and we would take that love outside the four walls of this church in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, you are a good, good father. And we are so thankful to be your sons and your daughters. And Lord, I pray that this Advent season, Lord, that there would be fresh intimacies that we get to experience with you, fresh conversations, fresh pleasures of just being with you. Lord, please, I just beg you that you would speak so loudly to help us to remember to pause, to be quiet, to be still, to just get away with you. And it would look a little bit different than our everyday. Lord, help us to learn your ways. Lord, help us to know that that's possible. That it's really possible to prepare our hearts in such a way that we make more, more, more room for you. Lord, I bless us as we go. Father, that you would fill us with joy unspeakable. That we would be your hands and feet extended. That when people would come in contact with us, we would be a sign and a wonder to the love and the goodness of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Make sure you hug somebody, bless somebody, just encourage somebody before you go. Amen. Amen.